Welcome again. Today we are going to go over a new chapter. In chapter three, we will be looking at how to describe data. Now we, we're going to approach these in terms of in five ways. So there are five characteristics that I will describe on how we can describe our data. So welcome to those who are watching this online and for those who are here present. So what are these five characteristics? One, we have this, we can describe our data based on the center. Now by center, we refer to this as the measures of center or measures of location, or sometimes called measures of central tendencies. So these are the words that you would you would see in the textbook. Now the different ways we can we can measure the center are by finding what is called the mean, the median, the and the mode. Or, and also the weighted mean. But for this class, we'll look at the mean, median, and mode. So this is the middle of our data set. Now, another way in which we can describe our data is based on variation. And in terms of variation, we're going to talk about the, the measures of the Measures of dispersion, such as the standard deviation, the range, the variance, and so on. We will, so we call these measures of dispersion. And then the third we will look at is distribution. And by distribution, we are referring, we are looking here at the measures of shape, meaning that our data could be symmetrical or could be left skewed or right skewed. So that's the measures of shape. So it's the measure of the skewness of the data. And another way in which we can describe our data is based on outliers. So we can detect if there are outliers in our data and we'll look at that and at some examples in this video. And last we would also look at changes over time. So here we're looking at trends in our data, for example. So these are different five ways in which we can describe our data. So let's start with number one. So number one is the center. And we said there are three ways. So the first way, we have the mean, we have the median, and then we have the mode. So this sometimes is called measures of center or measures of location. Now, what is the mean? Let's look at the mean. What's the mean? The mean is an arithmetic average. Let me write it down. So for these, we want to add all of the values and divide by the number of values um, that is being added. And I'll give you an example. So when we are computing the mean, so we're comp computing the mean of a set of numbers. So let's take an example of a set of numbers. So let's say we have this set of numbers. Five. So we have 
5.4. Oh, uh, let's just let me come up with a different set of numbers here. So let's say I have the set of temperature values, and then we want to find the average temperature, just like we saw in week in in week one. So the let's say the first we have 30 pretty cold um 40 50 45 60 and 70. now the question here is what's the average temperature based on this set of numbers so assuming that these are temperature values. Now, let's assume that this is drawn from a sample of other temperature values. So this is a sample data. Now, the sample mean, we use the, X, the symbol X bar. X bar represents the sample mean. If this were the population, then we're going to use a symbol mu. Mu represents the population mean. So this is the population mean. And X bar is the sample mean. In chapter one, we looked at the difference between a sample and a population. So so assuming that this is the a sample data from a set of populations is a subset uh, x bar will be equals to so let's say this variable temperature is represented as x so x is is the name of this variable so x bar will be equals to the sum of all the x values divided by the total number of, of temperature values, N. So what is N? N is our sample size. So that means this will be equals to 30 plus 40 plus 50 plus 45 plus 60 plus 70 divided by one, two, three, four, five, six, divided by six. And what's that? And so for these in my class, it's important that you have a scientific calculator or any calculator that you can use, or you can use your mobile phone as a calculator. So now I'm going to open up a calculator and perform this computation. So let's do it together. So bring out your calculator and add the set, these numbers. It's good to practice before your exam, before any assessment, so you're familiar with this tool. So we have 30 plus 40 plus 50 plus 45 plus 60 plus 70. Look at it again. 30 plus 40 plus 50 plus 45 plus 60 plus 70 is equals to 295. So if we entered this correctly, we should have 295 and divide that by from six. And what does that give us? That gives us about, it equals to 49.17. OK, so on average, the average temperature based on this sample data is 49.17 Fahrenheit. OK, so that's the mean. That's that's the mean. Now, how do we compute the median? So now we know how to compute the mean. That's the arithmetic average. Now, what about the median? median so the median is the middle value of it of a sorted data 
So given this these temperature values that we have, the first thing we need to do is sort this data in ascending order or in descending order, and the middle number is the median. Now, first, it depends on if the number is even, the set of numbers are even or odd. Now, using the same example that we have here, first we sort these numbers in ascending order. So we have 30, we have 40, we have 45, we have 50, we have 60, and 70. And so this set of numbers is even. Now, since this is even, the median will be the average of these two numbers. That would be the median. Now, if it's odd, if we have an odd set of numbers, the median is just, just one single number. What, is, what am I saying? So if I had these numbers, two, two, three, five, seven, eight. So this is an odd set of numbers. We have the sample size here is five. And so clearly here, this is the, the median. It's the middle, it's, it's the middle value of the data sets. So let's look back at our temperature values. So the median here will be the average of these two set of numbers. So which will be 45 plus 50 divided by two. And what is that? So again, know how to use your calculator. Of course, you don't need a calculator for this. For the, to add the numerator, you know that that is 95 divided by two. You also don't need a calculator for this, but in case you, you can't do the computation by hand, use your calculator so that you are close to being correct. So if you did this with a calculator, you should have, this is equals to 47.5. Now look at this, the median is 47.5 and the mean is 49.17, not very close. Well, pretty close, but not exactly the same. And why is that the case? These are things we'll talk about very soon. Because both of them are measures of center, but as we can see from this example, that the mean and the median are not the same value. So I would reiterate, how do you find the median? If the number, if, the, if you have an odd set of numbers, the median is just the middle number. If you have an even set of numbers, the median is the average of the middle set of numbers. For in this case, that is for the five and 50. So that's how to find the median. Okay. Now, looking at this example on the median, so let's say M represents the median. So we have here that M is equal to this. So looking at this number, we see that the median is less than the mean. It means that these, the distribution of this set of numbers is not symmetrical is a little bit skewed. And the skewedness of our data is always tilted towards the, where the, the values of the mean. And I would explain what that means. The mean, so if I decide that, okay, let's extend on this example. So we have 30, 40, 45, 50, 60, 70, and now let's say we have 100. And assuming that clearly looking at this, 100 might be an outlier in this example. Now let's see how this changes the mean and the median. So if we are to calculate the mean X bar, you add all of these and divide by seven. Let's use our calculator. So simply, um, the last computation was 295. 
plus 100, so that is 395 divided by 7. So we have 395 divided by 7, and we have now 56.43 Fahrenheit. So that's the, that's the mean. But what is the median? Now we have an, an, an odd set of numbers. So the median is simply 50. So the median year is 50. Now, what do you see here? The median is still less than the mean. The mean has actually increased. It's still less than the mean. What this mean here is that the mean is affected by outliers. However, the median is not affected by outliers. So the median is least affected by outliers. So whenever our data is not symmetrical, the measure of center should be the median. Otherwise, it should be the mean. So let me write down what I just said here. Um, the, the mean is affected by outliers. And the median, median <laughs> uh, is not affected. All right, let's, um, what, so we said outliers, but I've not yet explained what an outlier is. So how do we even detect these outliers? So we'll come into that very soon. But before we get there, let's talk about one other example of measures of center, which is the mode. So what's the mode? The mode is the most commonly occurring data. So the mode is the most commonly occurring data value. That is the mode. Meaning that if I reuse this example that we have above, we have 30, 40, 45, 50, um, 60, and 70. Now, let's say I now this asks you, what is the mode of this set of numbers? So clearly, there is no number here that repeats itself. So we say that the mode is an empty set. So there is no mode. There's no set of numbers that repeat itself because we said the mode is the most commonly occurring data values, the most commonly occurring data values. Now, if I change this example and I had 30, 40, 40, 45, 50, 60, and 70, and I ask the same question again, what's the mode? Now, the most commonly occurring data value is this. So we have this set of numbers. So we have that the mode is equals to 40. Okay. Now, what if I had this example, 30, 40, 40, 45, 50, 50, 60, and 70. And I ask again, what's the mode? In this case, we have two modes. We have 40 and we have 50. So this type of data is actually called bimodal. So this is bimodal. So our mode 
is 40 and 50. So that's how to measure the mode. OK. Now, as we move on in terms of the examples I give, you know, and we look at the concept of rounding, usually in the exam or in your homework, I'll tell you how many number of spaces you should round your values to. So yeah, I rounded to two decimal places and here yeah, it's in one decimal places. Um, for the for this course, I'll always tell you how many decimal places to round your answers to. So when you're doing your homework assignment, ensure you take in, take that into um, you you look into that so you you make less mistakes in terms of rounding. All right. So now let's um, look at something different. How to find the mean. Of, uh, of the frequency distribution. So remember our friend, the frequency distribution. So given the frequency distribution, remember I said that it's impossible for you to recall the original raw data as compared to when you have a stem and leaf plot in which you can actually recall the initial uh, set of, the, of data. So now what if we we, do, we, we, we are given a frequency distribution. How do we find the average of the, 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 the um, set of numbers? In this case, what we're going to compute is the expected um, value of the mean. So what, what was the, what's our expectation of the average? So mean of frequency of a frequency distribution. All right, so let's look at a let's create a frequency distribution in which we'll find the mean. And I will just come up with a different example, right? Similar to what we had in, in chapter one, where we had the age and then we had the frequency count for the age. So let's assume we have this frequency table in which we have the set of classes 21 to 30, um, 31 to 40 um 41 to 50 51 to 60 61 to 70 and 71 to 80 and the frequency count so between 21 to 30 yes yes we have 28 students in that age group then we have 30 students, we have 12 here, we have two, we have two, and we have two. So this is our frequency table, which you're familiar with. Now, how do we find the, 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 uh, the mean or the expected value of, of ages? Now, the way we do this is this way. So I'm going to just show you the expression. So we have, we want to find the mean. The mean is equals to the sum of the, remind me to mute my device before I create a video. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. So the mean is equals to the sum of this, so we say that in order to find this mean, we need to add, introduce something. So apart from the frequency count, we need to find the midpoint of this class, and we're going to call this X. So the class midpoint. So the class midpoint here would be, so we have, we'll take the average. So what do we have here for the first one? 21 plus 30 divided by 2 gives us 25.5. So this will be 25.5. And if you do the same for the others, for the same pattern, this will be 35.5, 45.5, 50, 
55.5 and 75.5 okay so that's the class midpoint now what we're going to do here is sum the, the multiply the frequency count by the midpoints and then divide that by the total number of the sample size so so the sum of f times x will give us the sum of our x, basically. And then we divide it by n. And so this is similar to what I just showed you up here. So here the x in this case is the, is the multiplication of these frequency counts by the mean of the average of this class average. And so this gives us an expected value. So it's not really the exact value, but what we expect the total um, sum of ages in that group um, to be. All right, so how do we go about this? So well, we, we have a different column that will say F times X. And you can use your calculator. I have already done this before now, so I would simply just put the answer. So this is 714, um, 1000, and let me verify this one. Um, 30 times 35.5, that is 1065. And then the, the rest, you have 546, 111, 131, and 151. All right, good. Next, uh, what do we need? We need to know n. So n will be equal to the sum of f. That will be n. So n is the sum of, so this total here. So n will be equal to the sum of all the values in f. Now, if you add all of that, you should have 76. So this is equal to 76, which is our n. Now, what is um, the sum of f of x, this column. So that's the sum of f of x. That's equals to 2,718. So you add all the numbers in this row, 714 plus 1,064, 65 plus 546 plus 111 plus 131 plus 151 should give you 2,718. Now with that, we can find the expected value of the mean of, of ages. So our expected value, which I'll just represent as X bar for, for now, is equals to 2,718 divided by 72, 76. And this is equals to 35 points. Seven six. So you can verify that with your calculator. So on average, so the average age is about thirty five point seven six. So this is the average of the frequency distribution. You know how to um, uh, to visualize the frequency distribution using the histogram. So if you create this histogram, the average of that histogram would or the center. The middle point of that this histogram will be around 35.76. Sweet. And um, what about the mean of a weighted? So, so this is a good example, and of course you can explore different examples. So with these, we're going to move on to. A to a different concept here. Um, let's look at distribution. So no, we looked at center. Next, let's look at distributions, and then we're not really going in order. So distribution. So I said by distribution, we're looking at the the 
the measures of shape. So the shape of the distribution. Now, there are three ways in which we can describe this. One, in one case, it looks like this. So we have, um, we have a distribution that is kind of symmetrical. I'll draw it again. So we call this a bell-shaped curve. So it looks bell-shaped. So we say this is normal. And, and so this is symmetrical. So this is the center, the mean, and this is 50%, and this is 50%, okay? So in this case, the mean and the median will be the same or, or pretty close to each other, especially if the distribution is, up, we said, is approximately normal. Now, another form of distribution that we can have is a distribution that is skewed towards the right. So we say this is right skewed, which means that the mean will be greater than the median. So the median will be somewhere around where most of the data point is, but the mean will be towards the right. So if this is the median, then this would be the mean, and we have an outlier to the right. So we say this is right skewed. And the third type of distribution in terms of measures of shape is less skewed. So we have something that looks like this and like this. So in this case, the mean will be less smaller than the median. And, and in this case, um, we say this is less skewed. So we have an outlier somewhere to the left. And remember we said that the mean is affected by an outlier. Okay, so those are the three types of distribution. Let's move on. Now let's look at what I put as number two, variation. All right, so for variation, this is a, a very important concept here. And we're going to look at different types of variation. So let's start with the different ways to measure variation. One way to measure variation in data, and let's bring, a, bring it an example. So let's say I have this set of, I have this, um, so I have a class one, and this is the, uh, this is the class um, score in the test. So it's the score 20 out of 30, another score 31, 50, 69, and 80. Now, one way to measure the variation is by computing a range. What is the range of this number? So the range is basically the maximum number minus the minimum number. Now, as you can see, the range is pretty easy to compute because looking at the data we have, the maximum number is 80, the minimum number is 20, and so this gives us a range of what, 60. Now, the downside of using the range as a measure of variation is that it does not consider all values. It only considers the extreme values. So if we have outliers, the range is inflated. And so it doesn't really give us a true measure of how this past the data is. So we generally don't use the range as the measures of variation. Now, what we mostly use is the, the variance and the standard deviation. So let's look at the standard deviation.
What is a standard deviation? So the standard deviation is the average distance a data is from the mean. That is the standard deviation. Now, to compute the standard deviation of a set of numbers, there are two ways of computing. You can compute the standard deviation of a sample data or a population data. And like I said, the symbols we use is very important. So given the set of numbers above the, for my class one, the let's say this is my sample, then that means my standard deviation is represented as S. If this was a population data, my standard deviation is represented as small sigma. So this is the sample standard deviation, STD, and this is the population, POP, population standard deviation. Okay, and I will show you how to compute um, both. So we can do this by looking at some examples. Now, so I have this class of class one, and let's say I asked you to determine the standard deviation. How would you go about it? We don't know yet. I will, ex I will show you. Now, to, so let's say this is class one, and let's say I have another class. Let's do an experiment here. Class two, and the this course this and this uh, this is also the grades of students in a particular course: thirty nine, forty four, fifty, fifty six, and sixty one. Okay, so we want to measure how what's the measure of spread of class one and also class two. My question for you is, which one would be bigger in terms of the variation of the measures of, in terms of the standard deviation? So we said that the standard deviation is, is what? We said is the average, um, the average distance the data values are from the mean. Now, the standard deviation can never be negative. It's always a positive value, okay? It's always a positive value, and the standard deviation represents the unit of the data itself. So before we find the standard deviation, let's look at something interesting. We had a set of numbers. What's the mean of these numbers? Remember, the mean of this sample will be equal to the sum of x divided by n. And the same thing here, the mean is equal to the sum of all the x values divided by n. So if you pick up your calculator, you calculate 20 plus 31 plus 50 plus 69 plus 80, that should give you 250 divided by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And what is that? That's 50. So the average score of students for the, in this class is 50. Then let's do the second one. If you add 39 plus 44 plus 50 plus 56 plus 61, it will also give you 250. Divided by 5, we have 50. So we can see that both classes are at the same location in terms of the measures of center. But the spread of, the data, of their data will be different. And that's what we're going to measure by computing the mean. I mean, by computing the standard deviation. So my question is, will the standard deviation of class one be greater than the standard deviation of class two? By just looking at this data value, do you think that the spread of class one is more than the spread of class two? So let's see that by um, true computation.
So I really don't like to look at talk about formulas, but I would I will show you the expression and how to use this expression um, to, to, to solve our problem. So S is a sample standard deviation. It's expressed as the sum of um, is expressed as the square root of the sum of x minus x bar squared divided by n minus 1. So so this is the expression for finding the sample standard deviation. Why n minus 1 and why not just n? So n minus 1 helps to overestimate the variation. Now, we are not dealing with the population in this case. So when we are dealing with um, the sample, we use n minus 1. OK, so how do we go about solving this? So one way I like to show students is by putting things in a table. So you have your X, you have, and you have X, you have X minus X bar, and then you have X minus X bar squared. That's what we'll need. So for the first one, let me go back to my notes. So we have 20, 31, 50, 69, and 80. Okay, now, the mean for the first one is 50. They are both 50. So this will be 20 minus 50. Is what? So let's use a calculator. 20 minus 50. Of course, we know it's going to be negative 30. But in case you don't want to use do the computation, which is as simple as this, you can use your calculator. And then you square this. When you square this, the, the sign changes. So 3 times 3, you know it's 9, of course. And so this will be 900. OK? So OK. And then you do the same for the rest. Um, so here is minus 19, and this will be zero. This will be 19, and this will be 30. Now, if you just added all of this set of numbers, this will be equals to zero. And you, of course, you can see 19 minus 19, 30 minus 30. So the sum of the, the mean difference will be equals to zero. And so that's why we, find, we, we, we do the sum of the squared mean difference. And then we find the square root of it. So what is 19 squared? So that gives us 361. This will also be 361. This would be zero. This would be 900. And what we do next year is to sum all these numbers. So we have 900 plus 900 plus 361 plus 361. So that gives us 2,522. OK? So here, going to the formula that we just set uh, up earlier, set up earlier, S is equal to the sum of 2,522 2, divided by N minus 1. What is N? 
n is equals to one, two, three, four, five. So n is equals to five. So that's five minus one. And so that's equals to the the square root of two five. 2,522 divided by 4. So that is about 630.5. Okay, now let's find the square root of that. So that gives us about, and let's round it to one decimal places. So that is First, that's about 25.1098. And to one decimal places, that will be 25.1. So, so this means, so. So this gives us the standard, this, the, the standard deviation of this first set of numbers of this of, of class one of class one. So one standard deviation from the mean is 25.1. Uh, now what about class two? Now class two, if you do it and 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 uh, I'll just give you the answer for time and I leave you to do all the computation as I've shown you here for and I'll call this S2. This is S1. When you, when you solve everything for S2, you should have 8.9. So that is going to be this the, the standard deviation. So let's answer our question. Is the standard deviation of class one greater than that of class two? The answer is yes. So the the um, class one has a much larger spread than class two. So that's what we've just computed. So you all know how to compute the sample standard deviation. This expression here computes the sample standard deviation, not the population standard deviation, but the sample standard deviation. OK. Now, what if you want to compute the population standard deviation? How do you go about it? The simple way is that instead of n minus one, you're simply dividing this by n. So what I'm saying here is that the population standard deviation sigma is simply equals to the square root of the sum of x minus x bar squared divided by big N. So where big N is the population size. So that's the difference. This is population and this is sample. Is that clear, everybody? All right. So now you should know how to compute the, the sample standard deviation and the population standard deviation. Good. So next, let's look at how to compute the variance. The variance is simply the square of the standard deviation. So meaning that we, we, once we compute the standard deviation, um, the square of it is simply the variance. So what am I saying here is that with removing the square root sign, what, what you get without the square root sign is the variance. So which means that in this example, the variance is 630.5. That's the variance. So how do we express this? So we have some we could have compute the sample variance, or we could compute the population variance. Variance. So the sample variance is simply 
S squared. So the square of the standard deviation. And the population variance is simply sigma squared. So the square of sigma. So that's how to find the variance. So back to this expression. So solve this expression without the square roots. That would be the variance. Fantastic. OK, from here, let's look at something different. The properties of standard deviation. So what are the properties of standard deviation? So looking at this, closely, closely grouped data would have what? A small standard deviation and spread out data will have what? A large standard deviation. And that's what we saw from this example of class one and class two. So closely grouped data such as class two will have a small standard deviation and spread out data such as class one would have a large standard deviation. And so this, that's the property of a standard deviation uh, right here, closely grouped data will have small standard deviation and spread out data will have a large standard deviation. Awesome. Great. So now we have learned various measures, various characteristics of, of how to describe data, such as the center, the variation, and the distribution. Fantastic. Now, if our data is normally distributed, then we can use the empirical rule, which I'm going to talk about to describe our data. So let's talk about the empirical rule. And this is the case if when our data is normally distributed. By normally distributed, we're saying that it's we, it's symmetrical, 50% to the left, 50% to the right, in, in, which was explained earlier. Good. So what we say in this case here is that 68% of our data will will fall within one standard deviation from the mean. One, stand, one SD, one side deviation from the mean. And if our data, 95% of, of the data will fall within two standard deviation from the mean and 99.7% of the data will fall within three standard deviation from the mean. My pen is misbehaving right now. Okay, let's see what's happening. Okay, let me stop sharing for a bit and I will fix what's happening with this system. Right. 
lights. Let's see what could be the problem. Let me change the battery. <laughs> That's sometimes the problem. Yeah, that was a problem. I need to charge the other battery. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to share my screen again. OK, so welcome back again. Let's continue. So we are seeing that 99.7% of our data will fall within three standard deviation from the mean. So this is the empirical rule. Now, if I'm to sketch this out, what we are seeing here is that we have the symmetric distribution. And we are simply saying that 60, if this is the center, the mean, zero, now, one standard deviation is here, one, two, and three, and negative one, negative two, negative three. So what we are saying that this area, one standard deviation from the mean, that 68% of our data falls within one standard deviation from the mean. So this is 68% of the data. It's not any better. Let me use a different color block. Okay, maybe it's better. 68%. Then Within two standard deviation from the mean, we say 95% um, of our data falls within two standard, between two standard deviation from the mean, 95%. And within three standard deviation from the mean, we have 99.7% of our data falls within that. So this is an approximate value. Much later in the, in the course, we will see how to compute this exact value using Minitab and also using um, the calculator. All right, so this is the empirical rule. And this will lead us to some very interesting concepts in, in statistics when we start making decisions, when we look at that which is usual versus that which is unusual. So now if data is within to standard deviation from the mean, we typically consider that, consider that to be usual. Now for data that are above two standard deviation from the mean, we consider them as unusual. And so we can, if we decide that if it's any data points outside two standard deviation from the mean, if we decide that, that it, those are outliers, so those are outliers, so they are unusual. Now within two standard devi deviation from the mean, those are not outliers, those are usual. So, so that's the concept that we, we that I will be introducing. Now, data values outside three standard division from the mean are really extremely rare. So the probability of those values will be very small. And we'll learn that when we look at probabilities as well. So this is what we call the empirical rule, the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. Okay. Cool. So with that, um, we will be looking at a completely different topic. So now we have a good understanding of how to describe our data. So next, this is, let me see. So 
So at this point, I would I would stop this video because it's this is about an hour and and then I will create another video. And so we'll talk about we have part one and part two of chapter three. So see you in the next video.